Catsymph TV. Hey everybody, Catsymph TV. And this is the first video in a new series we call Adventures in Retro Computing. First up, the Tandy M102, an early notebook computer from the mid-1980s. We'll explore its built-in applications, basic programming, and connecting it to modern computers. But first, please do subscribe to this channel for more cultural content coming out regularly. And please do consider supporting us. You can see our merch store and links to Patreon and Ko-Fi in the description below. In 1983, the Tandy Corporation released the TRS-80 Model 100, a small battery-powered computer with a built-in keyboard, LCD display, modem, and a variety of expansion ports. It is often considered among the world's first laptops, since the entire package was about the size of a large notepad or book, and was very easy to carry. And I have to say, it's cute, cute, cute. It was sold through the company's Radio Shack stores. You remember Radio Shack, right? And it became among their most popular models. It was particularly attractive to journalists, who could use it to write and submit stories using the built-in word processor and 300 baud modem. It supported additional applications with expansion ROMs, and came with support from Microsoft Basic for developing new programs and applications yourself. Supposedly, this was the last version of Microsoft Basic that Bill Gates contributed to himself. The combination of form factor and ease of programming makes it a popular model for hobbyists and enthusiasts to this day, and there are several users groups that share and support applications and hardware peripherals. It is affectionately known as the Model T in these groups. The Tandy M102 was an updated version of the M100, released in 1986. It was a little smaller and lighter than the original. This is the version we have here at HQ. And with that, let's turn our attention to the M2 now. As you can see, it boots right up. All the applications and files are resident in the RAM or ROM, as is the last state of the machine when you shut it off, so it instantly picks up where you left off. We have a few built-in applications, basic, text, a word processor, telecom for serial and modem communication, plus an address book and a scheduling app. And then there is space for files of our own. Now because everything is stored in RAM, the files eat up into the available memory at runtime. We originally had 24K, but now we're down to 14K. The main culprit is this TS-DOS thing. We'll come back to that one later. First, let's check out the text application. This is a simple word processor. When we start it, it asks for a file name to edit. I'm going to create a new document called Meow. And then you can just start typing. The keyboard is actually quite nice on this machine. Now if we press Label, we can bring up a menu of commands, accessible via the function keys. Let's go up here, press F7 to start a selection, and select part of our text. And now we can press F6 to cut it. There we go. Let's go back to the main menu. Now we can also access docs directly, so if we click Enter on a file ending in DO, it will automatically bring that file up in the text application. And what we're looking at here is actually part of the script for this video, which we wrote using the M102. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, back to the main menu, and let's go to BASIC. This is an interpreter for the Microsoft BASIC programming language. BASIC was fairly common on personal computers of the era, and was a language used by a lot of people, including myself, to learn programming. One of the first and most common statements is print, which can print out any string or number you like. You can also set variables, and we can use it in another statement. Now another cool thing here is that we have these two keys, graph and code, which can be used to bring up additional characters not shown on the keyboard. With code, we get these extended characters from other languages. We can print those out. And with graph, you actually get some cool graphics characters that you can use in your basic programs. Here is a few more. Okay, I'm going to load a basic program that we already wrote. It computes the factorial function. Basic programs end by default in .ba, 
but you can also load .do files from text. Let's list our little factorial program. Basic programs have line numbers. The specifics of the numbers don't mean much, except that they are arranged in order, and you can send the program to a particular line using the goTo statement. Now let's run it. Enter a number, and yes, 4 factorial is 24. Run it again, 6. 6 factorial is 720. Let's try it again with 10. 14. Yeah, factorial gets really big really quickly. You can clear the screen in BASIC using the CLS statement. Now we saw that you can use graphics characters in your programs, but the M100 and M102 also allow for more advanced graphics by addressing individual pixels of the screen. Type PSET and a coordinate, and you can see that that pixel was turned on. Let's turn on the pixel just to its right. Cool. There is also a line statement that we can use to draw lines on the screen. There, we just drew a diagonal line there. Now let's bring up another program that I wrote. This one plots a sine function on the screen using pixel graphics. Here's the listing. Let's run it. Remember that this is a slow processor from 1983. There, that was pretty awesome. Now in addition to graphics, we can also do sound. The basic statement beep produces the standard beep sound. Let's do that again. But you can also do sounds with specific pitches and durations using the sound statement. The first number represents the pitch, and the second the duration. Now the pitch values don't match frequencies in hertz, but they do support octave changes by having or doubling. If we double the pitch value to 8000, we get one octave lower. If we have our original value to 2000, we get an octave higher. Fortunately, there is a documented table matching standard concert pitches to values for the sound command. So armed with this knowledge, we can write basic programs to play musical melodies. Let's load up this basic program I made to do just that. Here's the listing. As you can see, we are using a single sound statement within a for loop and data and read statements to the specific pitches and durations of the tune. One might say that for basic programming, this is the way, as we are separating data and execution. This is the way. Okay, now let's run it to hear what we've got. Okay, let's clear the screen again. And I'm going to show you one of the advanced features of BASIC, the infamous peek and poke statements. These allow you to inspect and change individual bytes anywhere in the system's memory. So I can peek at some locations just to see what values are there. Now the numbers below 2 to the 15th, or 32767, are ROM slots. Above that we have RAM, as well as system locations. So let's peek at location 60,000. Now use the poke statement to change the byte at that location to a different value. If we peek again, you can see that it has changed. Now this is a very powerful and very dangerous feature, as I don't actually know what the memory at that location is used for, and I could easily mess things up. But there are some well-documented locations that are useful to peek and poke. For example, changing the value at this location, 63048, to 175 will reverse the video. There, now you can see that all the text on the screen is printed in reverse video. Poke that location again with zero, and we're back to normal video. Another use for peek and poke is to program the function keys with locations of useful routines in memory. If I set location 64268 to this value, and 64269 to this value, Together, they represent the location and memory of the command to clear the screen. So when I press F6, it should clear the screen now. Well, it doesn't work in BASIC, but trust me, this will come in handy later.
OK, let's go back to the main menu and bring up the telecom application. This allows us to connect peripherals or other computers via the serial port. Now in order to make this work, we will have to attach something to the serial port for the communication. You can connect a modern computer to the M102 using a USB to serial cable like this one. Now there is one more step when connecting a computer. This requires a so-called null modem cable rather than a standard serial cable. So we will add this null modem adapter. Now we can attach this clunky assembly to our M102 and the USB side to our MacBook Pro. On our connected MacBook Pro, we need to run a serial communication program like Minicom, which we can start now. You have to give it the Unix-style device name for your serial cable, which will be different for each adapter. In my case, it is this. Now before we can transmit anything back and forth, we need to make sure both devices have the same serial settings. Back on the M102, you can see this five character pattern, which we can also bring up with the stack command. This is a standard code indicating that we're set up for 9600 baud, 8-bit characters, no parity, parity can be even, odd, or none, one stop bit, whatever that is, and the final E says that we're using the Exxon, Xoff, Handshake protocol. If you look at Minicom, we see that the baud rate is set to something that is not 9600. So we can change that by pressing Alt-Z to bring up this menu, P for COM settings, and C for 9600 baud. OK, now the two sides match. Press Term or F4 on the M102 to enter Terminal Mode. A few new commands come up. There isn't one to clear the screen, though. But we can clear the screen using F6 that we set up earlier in BASIC. See, I told you that would come in handy. Now I can type something over here. I should see it on Minicom. Let's type another line. Now you can see that our lines are being typed over one another. This is because on serial communication, Enter is just a carriage return, which goes back to the beginning of the line. We need a line feed to advance to the next line. We can type a line feed using Control J. Let's do that in Minicom. You can see it advances to the next line. And now we hit Enter to go back to the beginning of the line. Now when we type, it will be shown on the next line. We can do the same thing from the M102 side. Press Control J and then Enter and then type something over here. Now transmitting back and forth this way is useful for short communications. But for transferring files back and forth, there is a better way. The M100 and M102 supported external disk drives via the serial port for added storage. We can simulate one of those disk drives using a pair of programs called a TPDD client and server. For the client, we're using that TS-DOS thing that I mentioned earlier on the M102 side. Let's start it, and we see a list of all the files currently saved in RAM. On the MacBook Pro, we need a program that acts as a server to present files over the serial connection. I'm using one called DL+. Now we'll put links to all of these programs in the description below this video. We can run it with this command. Once again, we need to specify the serial cable device. And now on TS-DOS, we can press F4 for disk, and we see the files being served from the MacBook Pro. To bring a file over to the M12, select it. I'm going to select this one called i90.do and press F1 to load it. Hit Enter to use the same name. Let's do the same with this other one called AA. Now go back to the main menu. We can see these files are now on our local system. Select i90.do, which brings up the text application. This is actually a bit of text from our video of i90 in Seattle last year. I'll put a link to that video above. Similarly, we can open up aa.do. We see a bit of a script from my review of a photo book by Abandoned America. Yes, we cover a wide range of topics at CatSynth, but not everything. We can also bring over basic programs this way. 
Let's select this one called Piano One, which I got from the Club 100 website. This is a cute basic program that lets us play our M102 like a piano keyboard. OK, load it and exit. Because it is a text file with a DO extension, selecting it goes to text, where we can see a listing. Let's go to Basic and explicitly load it here using the load statement. There we go. List the program. It's pretty long, so I'm going to press Ctrl-C to stop. And now let's run it. OK, it's showing us a layout of the keyboard and what musical pitches will be played by each key. It takes a moment or two to figure out the layout in order to play some actual music. But I think I'm getting the hang of it. OK, let's play something. OK, we hope you've enjoyed our look at the Tandy M102 and some of the ways we can have fun with it in the 21st century. In upcoming videos in this series, we'll look at how to use the serial port to connect to the internet and how to upgrade it with additional memory and add the venerable CPM operating system. So please do come back for those. And if you have any questions about anything you saw, please do let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching and please subscribe to CatSynth TV.